I'm going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 18 a little bit and then 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And we're looking at King Hezekiah starting a new king. So King Hezekiah, his name means strengthened of Jehovah. He's the 12th king of Judah and he reigns 29 years. His spiritual state is good. One of the best kings. His parents is King Ahaz and Abijah. Abijah, his mother. King Ahaz, his father. King Ahaz was a bad king. So you got Hezekiah going against the grain and being a good king. It's rare that your parents do so bad and then you turn out good. That's a rare thing. His prophets is Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Micah. So remember, all those major minor prophets, most of them, they line up with these kings that you see in Kings and Chronicles. So it's not that the prophets are happening way later since they're at the end of the Old Testament. They actually take place during the times of these kings. Hezekiah's age at death is 54, and he's known for restoring the temple and for his prayer that added 15 years to his life. And the text that you see Hezekiah in is 2 Chronicles 29 through 32, Isaiah 37 through 39, and 2 Kings 18 through 20. So there's a lot of chapters dedicated to King Hezekiah. So chapter 18, and we're going to talk about how to turn things around. Hezekiah, he's coming off of the reign of King Ahaz, and he really does his best to try to turn things around, get it back to God. So it's chapter 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So during the reign of Hosea, son of Elah, the king of Israel, over in Judah, the son of Ahaz, Hezekiah, begins to reign. Twenty and five years old, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abiah, the daughter of Zechariah. So in rare cases, the son turns out to be better than the father, in rare cases. And Hezekiah, you're not going to be able to say that he brought his mother Abiah to shame. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs 29, 15. It's a real good verse in regards to this. And it says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, 15. You can't say that about Hezekiah. He's not going to bring his mother, Abiah or Abijah, to shame. He does good, and he turns out better than his father. So his mother's name is Abiah. She's called Abijah in 2 Chronicles 29.1. And this name means Jehovah. Abijah means Jehovah is my father. So even though Hezekiah didn't have a good mother, he had a, or he didn't have a good father, he had a good mother. Maybe that's why he turned out so good. Maybe you're in a relationship with somebody and they're not godly and you're worried about your kids. Be the best that you could be for God and maybe that'll cause your son and daughter to turn out better. Her name means Jehovah is my father. Let your kids know who your father is. Let them know about the Bible and maybe you can turn things around for them. So 20 and 5 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abiah, the daughter of Zechariah. 
And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Now, David wasn't his, like, immediate father. It was, like, his great-great-great-great-grandfather or whatever. So it doesn't say grandfather in here. So that could cause some confusion. But that he was in the line of David. And Hezekiah lived up to the David comparisons. You see, all the good, all the kings are compared to David. That's the standard. And only three kings of Judah come close to David. That would have been Asa in 1 Kings 15, 11, and Josiah in 2 Kings 22 and verse 2, and Hezekiah here. Hezekiah was probably the best king outside of David. And, and better than Solomon in many ways. Now, verse 4, he removed the high places and break the images. This is why he was so good. This is how he turns things around here. He removes some things, breaks some things, and cuts down some things and breaks some more stuff. He removed the high places. Now, you know what the high places are. If you've been listening to these, that's where they, these high places they would go to and build groves there put their idols or false gods in there and worship them and do all kinds of other sin in there. It's in high places because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness, this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil likes high places. So that's why they're up in high places. And he removes the high places. You want to turn things around? You got to remove the high places and break the images. He broke them. You want to turn things around? You need to break some things. And he cut down the groves, those trees where they would worship idols in the midst of them. And they like them groves and then trees because Hosea talks about the shadow thereof is good in them groves. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So they like getting in the, under the shadow of them trees and doing that stuff. And it says, And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. You remember back there in Numbers, they got bit by them snakes. And the Lord tells Moses to make that serpent of brass. And when they would look on it, they would be healed. And what that pictured is, the Lord Jesus Christ, he became our serpent on a pole. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But what happened was they kept that serpent on a pole. They kept it and took it with them. And it, it became like this. It ended up being one of their idols. But he break it in pieces, that serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. A piece that means a piece of brass. So he's turning things around. Perhaps he was under the conviction of the preaching of Micah. You know, Micah would have been was prophesying during his reign. And you see that that brazen serpent that Moses had made, them worshiping that brazen serpent will be like a Christian worshiping a cross instead of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make no sense. Why would you worship the brazen serpent, the serpent on a pole, instead of, instead of God? It doesn't make no sense. And um, maybe... Uh, Maybe Hezekiah was under a conviction about the, from the preaching of Micah. It says in Micah 3.12, it says, Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. So you see, Micah, he would preach against those high places, he probably heard Micah preaching against those high places and he knew that they're wrong and he's taking heed to what his prophets are saying. 
Now, verse 5 in chapter 18, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So Hezekiah is the best king since David and Solomon. David and Solomon were kings of, that, of the United Kingdom of Israel and not just Judah. And you could look at that and, and think, well, he's the best one that ever was. But it seems he's the best one of the kings of Judah, the divided kingdom. Better than any of them before him and better than any of them after him. It, uh, David and Solomon wasn't just kings of Judah, they was kings of the combined one. And he trusted in the Lord, and trusting in the Lord can rub off on others. And it says in 2 Kings 18.30, it says, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. This is one of the enemies saying this. He says, Neither, neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying the Lord will surely deliver you. Us and the city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. You see, trusting in the Lord is contagious. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, and he was causing other people to trust in the Lord too. That's how you turn things around. You trust in the Lord, then somebody else over here trusts in the Lord, and it just goes on and on and on. So it can rub off on others. And it says in Psalm 118, 8, Better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Proverbs 29, 25, another one. In Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth, putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Hezekiah was doing that. That's how you turn things around. Put your trust in the Lord. Now, verse 6, it says, For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. You see, Solomon, what did he clave to? Solomon cl clave to strange women, and it turned his heart away from the Lord in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 2. But Hezekiah, he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him. And that caused him to keep his commandments. So we need to make sure our hands cleave to the sword. It's like Eliezer in 2 Samuel 23, 9 through 10, it said, His hand clave into the sword. And he, he, he smote him till his hand was weary. Our sword is the King James Bible, Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Our hand needs to cleave to the sword says in verse 7, And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. So he prospered. You prosper in the Lord's path. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 9 says, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them that ye may prosper in all that ye do. You keep the word of the Lord, you're going to prosper. To prosper just means be just successful and to succeed. It says in Joshua 1.7. It says, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to, right, to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's what Hezekiah is doing. Psalm 1, 3, another good one. In Psalm 1, in verse 3, it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, the man that delights in the law of God meditates in the law day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth 
shall prosper. That's Hezekiah. He's turning things around. And Hezekiah had the he has the godly kind of rebellion. You see, he rebels against the king of Assyria. You see, most times rebellion is bad. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And most times when people rebel, they're rebelling against God. They're rebelling against their parents. They're re rebelling against the authority in place. That's good authority. But Hezekiah, he's rebelling against a wicked king. So rebellion can become godly. Just like in Daniel 3.18. In Daniel 3.18, rebellion became godly. When the three Hebrew uh, boys were going to be thrown in the fiery furnace, they were going to be thrown in there because they was rebelling against King Nebuchadnezzar that was wanting them to bow down to a false image. But they said in Daniel 3.18, or in Daniel 3.17, uh, they said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that, thou will not, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They were very, very rebellious against King Nebuchadnezzar. And God blessed them for it and saved them from the burning fiery furnace. And then in Daniel 6.10, Daniel is rebellious. In Daniel 6.10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He was in open rebellion. You see, they got the king to sign this paper that said, Sign this decree that said you can't pray to any god. And what does Daniel do? He goes into his house, opens the window on purpose, being in open rebellion, and kneels upon his knees three times a day and prays, giving thanks to God. That's when rebellion, and there's times like that where rebellion becomes godly. And in Acts 5.29, it says... Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. When it, if it, when it comes to doing right and do it when God said, and man telling me to not do what God said, it's better to obey God rather than men and rebel against man. So that's what Hezekiah was doing. He was turning things around. He was following God and going against men that was trying to keep him from following God. And it says, He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. You see, the Philistines were God's enemies. Hezekiah and the Lord had mutual enemies. And you know, in Amos 3.3, 3, it talks about how can two walk together except they be agreed. So he, he smote the Philistines even unto Gaza, the southernmost city of Philistia, and the borders thereof from the Tower of the Watchmen to the Fence City. So they got the same enemies. You can tell they're on the same page because they got the same enemies. <clears throat> now, we're at the paragraph mark there in 2 Kings 18. Now I want you to go to 2 Chronicles 29. And we're looking at the same king. You see, the uh, First and Second Kings, they're talking about the same kings as First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Kings is more of a detail of the kings of Israel, while First and Second Chronicles gives you more detail on the kings of Judah. Hezekiah is the king of Judah. You're going to find even more about him in Second Chronicles 29. So look at Second Chronicles 29 and verse 1. Now it's going to go over some same detail, but it's also going to add a lot more detail in there. So Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah. Remember, in the other one, the other chapter, it called her Abijah. Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. So Hezekiah, he, like we said, he's the son of Ahaz. 
His prophets are Isaiah, see Isaiah 1-1, Hosea, Hosea 1-1, and Micah, see Micah 1-1. And he prophesied, uh, all the, and all these guys prophesied during his reign. He didn't have a good father. Hezekiah had a bad father, but a good mother. Her father, now his, his mother had a good father named Zechariah, possibly of the priesthood. See Second Chronicles twenty four twenty for that. She's possibly he was possibly of the priesthood that Zechariah. Now verse two, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. Hezekiah was as close to the standard set by David than any other king. And verse three, he. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So now it's getting into what he did with the temple. Hezekiah addresses spiritual problems. That's how he's turning things around. You see, most, pretty much all these presidents and people in these high positions, they don't address the spiritual problems. They're addressing all these problems that you can just see with your eyes. Imagine if they got up there and said, we all need to get our Bibles out and start doing what God said. They don't ever do that. But Hezekiah addresses spiritual problems. First, he opens the doors. He's opening doors that his father had shut back there in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. Or 2 Kings, yeah, you can read about it in 2 Chronicles 28, 24 where Ahaz shut the doors. Back there in uh, 2 Chronicles 28, 24, it says, And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. You see that? His father shut the doors. Ahaz comes through and opens the doors. And then he repairs what Ahaz cut in pieces and had destroyed. So he's having to rebuild things that his father had tore down. And it says, And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. So he brought in the right people to do the, the service in the house of the Lord. It had to be the Levites. He knows the right people for the job. And the east street led to the east gate of the temple. He's getting all this together. He gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. He said, Hear me. You know, what did Jesus always say? Ye that hath, hath an ear, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Matthew eleven fifteen. And he sanctifies them. Sanctify means set up is set apart for service. And it says in Isaiah fifty two eleven, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. He knew they had to be clean if they was going to be handling all this stuff in the temple. You need to be clean inside and out. They would need to wash their body. They would need to get right with God on the inside. They needed to carry out the filthy things that Ahaz brought in. He brought in some filthy stuff into the temple. Back there in 28-23, uh, it's uh, talking about Ahaz. It says, For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. He brought the filthy things into the house of the Lord, and it was the ruin of him. Ahaz, or Hezekiah's cleaning house, getting rid of all that stuff. So he carried out the filthy things that Ahaz brought in. And Ephesians 5.26 talks about how to get us clean. How can you get clean today? You see, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. What will clean you? It says in Ephesians 5.26 that he might sanctify, there's that word sanctify again, and cleanse it 
with the washing of water by the word. You get the word in you, it's like Drano flushing your veins out. Now, Second Chronicles 29 and verse 6, he says, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Your old man. You see, your old man is what's causing you trouble. And they had a different old man that caused them trouble. It was their father. Their fathers had trespassed. Their fathers had started going down the wrong way. And your old man, your flesh, has trespassed. He wants to go down the wrong way. And trespasses is just is sin against somebody else. And, they, and their fathers had trespassed and did evil. They forsook God. What you got to do is turn your face back to God. Hezekiah was turning things around. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, it says, it, it talks about how Paul is, is commending the Thessalonians. And he says, For they themselves show of us what manner of in, entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You got to turn back to God. You got to turn things around. It says, For our fathers have trespassed, and done that which was evil, and the eyes of the Lord, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. They turned their back on God. Hezekiah's turning everybody back towards God. We need to turn to God from idols, put off the old man. You see, their old man had messed them up put them down the wrong way our old man our flesh messes us up puts us down the wrong way we need to put off the old man as paul talks about in the new testament our flesh we need to die daily it says in verse 7 also they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the god of israel see they closed the doors they shut up the doors maybe you've closed a door of utterance you know, Paul talks about a door of utterance and and doors being open and closed. It says in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, he said, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. There's people that want to close those doors. And 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12 Paul says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So, he talks about an open door. Colossians 4, 3. Colossians 4 and verse 3. With all praying also for us, that God would open to us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Maybe you've closed a door of utterance. Just go back and open it. Ahaz closed the doors back in Second Chronicles 28, 24, and he put out the lamps. But you were never supposed to let the lamps go out. In Leviticus 24 and verse 2, it says, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. You were never supposed to let the lamps go out you want to keep the fire burning don't let your lights go out keep the fire burning ahaz had been too busy burning incense in the high places to the false gods in second chronicles 28 3 and it says in verse 8 wherefore the wrath of the lord lord was upon judah and jerusalem and he hath delivered them to trouble to astonishment and to hissing as you see with your eyes. You see, you, you mess around, you're going to get in trouble. And a hissing, that's a sound of scorn and contempt. 
It's an it's a object of scorn and derision. And he delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. He says, For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Be sure to see and take heed to the consequences of sin. Their fathers had fallen by the sword. Hezekiah saw the consequences that met their fathers. And that's how he turned things around. He, he could see and take heed to those consequences of sin. The Bible is a sword and it smites. The fathers fell by the sword. You mess around, you're going to fall by the sword. It says, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. You see back there, they, they've, because of Hezekiah and his wickedness, their sons and daughters and wives got put into captivity, just as the devil can take a man captive today. 2 Timothy 2.26 tells you about that. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26 says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You see, it's the devil's will. That's what he wants to do is to take you captive. Hist and historically, this they were taken captive back here. This happened during Ahaz's reign in 2 Chronicles 28.5. And so you need to lead your family away from the enemy because they will take them captive. Verse 10, it says, now as, He said, Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. And it's an amazing thing that the God of heaven would make a covenant, which is an agreement with man. We believe on Jesus Christ. And we get saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 9. That's our covenant today. You believe on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved from wrath through him. Hezekiah wanted to make a covenant with the Lord to be saved from his fierce, fierce wrath. He says, My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. He says, be not negligent. Don't be careless. Don't be accustomed to not do what you need to do. He said, we need to burn incense to God. Ahaz was back there burning incense to idols back there in 28.4. We need, we need to turn to God from idols and start burning incense to him. The Levites were the ones selected for this service. He knew the right ones to select for this service. And he, he just said, be not negligent. That's a good word. Don't be negligent. You know, it talks about in James 4.17. Let's look at that verse real quick. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's a sin to not do something you knew you were supposed to do. So don't be negligent. Turn to God from idols. Turn to God and do what you're supposed to be doing. Verse 12, it says, Then the Levites arose, Mahath, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Marari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehalelil, and of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joah, and the sons of Elizaphan, Shimri, and Jael, and of the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah, and of the sons of Heman, Jehiel, and Shimei, and of the sons of Jeduthun, Shemaiah, and Uziel. So these guys here, these are uh, 14 leaders that undertook to collect and prepare for the cleansing of the temple. And you got there, Mahath and Joel, they're of, the son, they're of the Kohathites, and that's the priest line. And then you got Kish and Azariah, they're of Marari, and that's the line that was musicians and singers and keepers of the temple. And then you got 
Joah and Eden, they're of Gershon, and they're musicians and singers and keepers of the temple. And then you got Kohath and Marat, the 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 Kohath and the Marara and the Gershon, they're sons of Levi, First Chronicles six one. And them guys came from Kohath, Marara, and Gershon. That's why they're called Kohathites and the Gershonites and the Mararites. So those are the 14 leaders that undertook to collect and prepare for the cleansing of the temple right there in those verses. And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So, um, back there in verse 13, that Elizaphan was the head of the Kohathites of the priestly family. You see that in Numbers 3.30. And Asaph, back there, is the leader or singer, leader of the singers of, of the musicians. Leader of the singers and musicians. And then the Heman and Jaduthan are musicians. You see that in First Chronicles 16. 41 through 42. So it says, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So they gathered together. They got to get together. They need to help one another. They can't do it on their own. And gathering together is part of growing because you're being accountable to each other. And they sanctified themselves. They set apart themselves for the Lord's work. And if they don't cleanse themselves inside and out, they couldn't cleanse the house. You see, the word of the Lord sanctifies and cleanses the church in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, as we talked about. And it says, And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. See, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost today. Keep that in mind. When you read this, the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. Also, the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kedron. So they went into the inner part. You see, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to, you need to go into the inner part and let the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews 9, 11, have control inside you and bring out bring out the uncleanness. A good verse, Colossians 1, 27. It says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've got Christ in you. Let him carry out the unclean things out of the temple. Your body's the temple, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And you need to bring out all uncleanness. It all needs to be got out. Ephesians 5, 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. He lives in you. Let him be your head. Let him choose what needs to be taken out. Get rid of all the uncleanness. And then let him truly furnish you. Just like 2 Timothy says, that the man of God may be truly furnished unto all good works. And what did they do with the temple? They, they furnished it. They furnished the literal temple with literal furniture. And now verse 17, Now they began the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. And so it says, They sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And eight days, that's the number of new beginnings, the number eight. Then they went in to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread thereof with all the vessels thereof. See, they truly furnished it and cleaned it, made sure it had everything that was supposed to be in there. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz and his reign did cast away in the transgressions have we prepared 
and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. You see, you need to be thoroughly furnished by the Word of God, according to 2 Timothy 3.17. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. They made sure that temple was clean, thoroughly furnished. You need to make sure on your inside you're clean and thoroughly furnished. You see, the world tries to remodel you on the inside and make you conform to them. But Romans 12, verse 2 it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. They went into that temple. They transformed it back to how God wanted it. Made sure it was thoroughly furnished. They repaired all the things that King Ahaz had messed up. Then, king, then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. He rose early. Get up early. With God's purpose on your mind. And it says in verse 21. And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven he goats for a sin offering for the kingdom. And for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. Notice that seven. We saw eight was number of new beginnings. Seven, the number of completeness, the number of perfection. And that's why you see that showing up so much. So they killed the bullocks, and the priest received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. So they received the blood, and the blood they, the blood goes into basins, and they sprinkle it as was commanded in the law of Moses. It was to sanctify the temple. Now, verse 24, verse 23, And they brought the he-goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. This was to atone for the sins of both uh, of everybody. Laying hands shows a transfer of sin to the animal. They put, that's why they put their hands on it. And it acknowledges that the people deserve death like that animal. But the animals taking their place, just like the true Lamb of God took our place. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation. That's what happens when we get in contact with the blood of Jesus. It makes reconciliation. And made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. Jesus is my sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is my burnt offering. He took my hell on the cross. He took an eternity of hell of every, for everybody when he was on the cross. And it says, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with psalteries and with harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So it said by the kings, by, uh, and of Gad the king's seer. A seer is a prophet. It says in First Samuel 9, and verse 9, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So that's what that is. But it said he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, and with psalteries, and with harps. So these are the instruments of David. In 1 Chronicles 15, 16, it says, And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries, and harps, and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So there... Hezekiah is greatly influenced by King David. Nehemiah 12.36 Nehemiah 12.36 says, And his brethren, Shemaiah and Azareel, Melali, Gilali, Mai, Nathanael, and Judah, Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra the scribe before them. So you see, these instruments are connected with David. 
and that's what Hezekiah was bringing in. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, the king of Israel. So he's even changed the music, got the music changed. And, you know, God uses music. Elijah, the prophet, called for a minstrel to play back there in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15. He called for a, a minstrel to play before he started preaching. And <clears throat> it says, Begin also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And you know what David is called in 2 Samuel 23, 1, the sweet psalmist of Israel. He's highly influenced by David. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. And all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. You know, like it says in Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. You might as well bow and worship now. Everybody's going to do it eventually. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Romans 14, 11. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worshiped. Worshiping in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs just like it says to do in the New Testament. And Asaph, most likely the Asaph of Psalm 50, that wrote Psalm 50, 73, 77, and 79 through 83. It says, Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. You know, separated. They separated themselves. Separated from a common to a sacred use. They consecrated themselves. And Consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings. And as many as were of a free heart, burn offerings. You know, what does it say in uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7? It says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful, cheerful giver. And they, as many as were of a free heart, brought burnt offerings. And the number of the burnt offerings which the congregation brought was three score and ten bullocks. So three score, that's sixty. You got a score is twenty, so three twenties would be sixty. And then ten would be seventy, so seventy bullocks and a hundred rams and two hundred lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated things were six hundred oxen, and three thousand sheep. So they're freely given. They're just being being cheerful givers. And But the priests were too few, so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings, wherefore their brethren the Levites did help them, till the work was ended, and until the other priests had sanctified themselves. See, you got people stepping it up. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. You see, because the priests had been corrupted through their idolatry. But you got people stepping it up and making things happen. You want to turn things around, you got to step up and make things happen. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. Let all things be done decently and in order, as Paul said. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. And we find it was done in 16 days, as it said back there in verse 17. The thing was done suddenly. You know, be urgent about getting right with God. You know, there's some urgency to it. You know, he said, today is the day of salvation. He said, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time that vanishes away. Do, do what you need to do today. 
Worry about tomorrow or later. Do all that you need to do today. Have some urgency. Get right with God today. Don't put things off that you need to do for God later. Go ahead and do them today. Make sure that the thing is done suddenly. But I'm going to stop with that. We got a lot more to go on Hezekiah. One of the greatest kings. And we can learn a lot of things from him.